Some time ago, I saw an episode of Filament Friday where Chuck made a color and lay on the bottom of a print. So it's been done before, but I think it's worth a revisit using different tools and a minor refinement or two. In this video, I'll start with a bitmap image, trace it into a vector drawing, and then use it to make an inlaid print using Inkscape, FreeCAD, and Prusa Slicer. In order to make our lives much easier later on, we need to have consistent coordinates for our vector image. Unfortunately, Inkscape and FreeCAD have very different ideas about coordinates. In FreeCAD, it's much easier to work with if the center of the vector image corresponds with the origin. Inkscape, on the other hand, likes to put the entire page in quadrant 1 with the origin at the corner of the page. The rulers in Inkscape's GUI suggest that the origin is at the lower left-hand corner of the page. However, it turns out that when you actually save as a vector graphic, the origin will be at the upper left-hand corner of the page. I suppose this simple translation is done so that the GUI reflects the expectations of graphic artists versus the technical standards for scalable vector graphics. This means that to get our vector logo centered on the origin, it's actually going to be off the page, in the upper left corner. That's not a problem, it'll save it just fine that way. But we need a good way to snap the center of the vector drawing to the upper left hand corner of the page, so we'll use a pair of guidelines. It doesn't really matter what page size we use, so we'll just stick with the default A4. As we can see from the chart, A4 pages are 297 millimeters high. So we're going to need to create a guideline with a Y value of 297, intersecting another guideline with an X value of 0 in order to create a new center to snap to. In spite of the values we'll set, this represents the origin as saved to the SVG. So we drag a guideline down from the top ruler and then double click on it so that we can set a numeric value. Set y equal to 297. Also check the locked checkbox so that its position doesn't get disturbed. Now drag a guideline from the left hand ruler, double click it and set its x value to 0. Again click the locked checkbox. Now to configure the snapping behavior we want over on the right hand side of the window. We definitely want snapping enabled and we want to snap to bounding boxes. Further, we want to snap to the center of the bounding boxes. And finally, we want to snap to guides. With the setup out of the way, let's get to it. Go to File, Import, and select the bitmap image that we want to turn into an inlay. Just accept the defaults for the import. This is an image I used when I printed tokens for our friend at Cat Rangers, a nonprofit cat rescue. They used it in their second annual charity golf tournament. So there's our image, but we need it as a vector graphic. So right click on the image and select Trace Bitmap. We can click the live preview in order to see if we're tracing what we need. It is helpful if the part we want to trace is black and everything else is a good bit lighter. For images that don't trace well, it may be worth pre processing in the GIMP or your favorite image editor first. Once it looks right, click OK, and this will leave us with the vector trace of the bitmap overlaid on the bitmap itself. We can dismiss the trace dialog. Grab the vector trace and slide it over to where the guidelines intersect. You can see when we reach the right point, the display will show us bounding box midpoint to guide intersection. This is what we want. Now we delete the image and get it out of the way and save the vector graphic. We'll just call it pawprint.svg. On to FreeCAD. Other than the part workbench, I will also be using the draft clone tool. To make the workflow smoother and easier, I have already included that tool in a custom toolbar for the part workbench. If you need help creating a custom toolbar, see my other video suggested above. For the sake of demonstration, I'll create a simple maker coin. We'll start with a circle, let's say 20 millimeters in radius, and we'll extrude that to 3 millimeters to make our coin. Since we're putting the inlay on the bottom, switch to the bottom view. Now import the vector drawing. Select 
so that we can see the next step clearly, I'll hide the coin for now. I can see that we've gotten five paths, so highlight each of the paths just to make sure that we've got everything we need and nothing extraneous. If there are any extraneous specks or shadows, delete those paths now. Since that all looks good, select all of the paths and join them together as a compound object. You will notice that the drawing has been imported upside down. This is a natural consequence of the differing coordinate system between Inkscape and FreeCAD. Inkscape considers anything above the top of the page to be negative numbers. We can solve that with a simple rotation. Select the compound object and go to Placement in the Data Pane. Since we want to flip the drawing along the x-axis, change our axis of rotation. Set x to 1 and z to 0. Set the angle to 180 and the drawing flips right side up. Because we took the trouble to center the drawing on the origin in Inkscape, we can do this without any translation. We also don't have to do any work to center the drawing on the coin because both are created at the origin. That accomplished, bring the coin back so that we can check it for size. Obviously, the drawing is too large. Fortunately, we can solve that easily enough. Select the compound object and create a draft clone. Because the tool invoked the draft workbench, we get its standard grid. We can make that grid go away by hitting G and then R. It's a common enough operation that it's worth knowing the shortcut. Since we are working with the clone now, hide the original compound and select the clone. In the data pane, go down to scale and set the X and Y values to 0.15 or 15%. Leave the Z value alone since neither the SVG nor the draft clone have any thickness. They're just the surface at this point. That fits in the coin, but it's a little too small. Let's try 25%. Uh, perhaps we should try 25% rather than 25 times. Much better. That looks perfect. Again, because the drawing is centered on the origin, scaling doesn't leave any translation and centering to deal with. So we're good to go now. One of the problems I had when I followed Chuck's video was registration. When I pulled the objects into Prusa Slicer, they weren't lined up neatly. Further, because they were both green and the inlay could only be seen from the bottom, it was very hard to get them lined up as they needed to be for printing. I can solve this by placing a registration outside of the coin itself. We don't have to worry too much about it, it's just for alignment, it's never actually going to be printed. So I'll create a simple tube. Let's set the outer diameter to 10 millimeters and the inner diameter to 9 millimeters just to create a small ring. Now we'll do a translation to slide it out of the way, just over to the side of the coin. Make sure the ring is selected and do Edit Duplicate Selection to create a second ring. Set its outer diameter to 9 millimeters and its inner diameter to 8. So now we have concentric rings that we can use to line up the inlay in the coin inside the Prusa Slicer. Because this is an inlay of physical matter, we need to have a thickness to it. We're going to extrude it to 0.6 millimeters, which will correspond nicely to the line height when we print. Since I'll be printing this in PETG, I generally set the first layer at 0.4 millimeters and 0.2 millimeters thereafter, so we'll end up printing two layers for the inlay. Now we seem to have the extrusion we want, but as we examine it further, we see that it's gone in the wrong direction. Go to the data pane and change the extrusion from 0.6 millimeters to negative 0.6 millimeters. Now the extrusion is going into the coin as we wanted. But this leaves us an inlay and the coin overlapping in the same space. To make this a proper inlay, we need to cut out the coin to fit the inlay. 
So select the coin, then the inlay, and do a Boolean cut. The cut does not consume the inlay, it just hides it away. We can pull it back out later and use it elsewhere. Select the coin and the outer ring and fuse them into one part. The part design workbench won't allow two completely separated pieces to be one body, but the part workbench doesn't mind at all. Now if we open up the fusion and open up the cut, we can find the inlay. So we'll select it and the inner ring and fuse them, making that a second part. Just to avoid confusion, I'll rename the fusions as inlay and coin. Now it's just a matter of separately exporting the two parts for the slicer. Since I'm using the latest version of Prusa Slicer, I'll export them as step files. That's free CAD's job done. Next stop is Prusa Slicer. So here we are in Prusa Slicer. Let's get to it. First import the inlay.step. There we have it complete with the registration ring. Now we'll import the coin and we can see by the registration rings that indeed they are not aligned. We can look at the bottom and highlight the coin for a moment. You can see that if we tried to print it like this, we'd have a bad collision and knock the inlay right off the bed. Select the inlay and click move. It would be very hard to get it perfect with the mouse, but we can get it in the neighborhood. That's looking pretty close, but we need to be precise. Fortunately, we can go to the Object Manipulation dialog and we can make fine changes to the positioning numerically. As you can see, as we select a box, a helpful arrow is displayed to show us how changes will move the object. In order for a change to take effect, we must click in another text box momentarily. As we get close, we can make ever smaller adjustments. There, that looks as good as it's going to get. We're within a hundredth of a millimeter or 10 microns, which is better accuracy than the printer can do anyway. Highlighting the coin from the bottom, that looks perfect. But this leaves the registration rings that we really don't want to print. So right-click the inlay in the object list, then hover over Add Negative Volume and select Slab. Now move the slab until it is roughly centered on the registration ring and then click Scale and shrink it down so it covers the ring but not the inlay. Don't forget to scale the height up so that we remove the entire ring and don't leave part of it floating in space. Now right-click on Coin, again Add Negative Volume and choose Slab and do the same procedure. We have to do this for each object as the negative spaces only apply to the object they're attached to in spite of appearances. As you can see when we go to the slice view, we now have neatly sliced what we wanted and everything in the negative space is gone. Perfect. Now we can click on the eye icon for coin to temporarily turn it off, leaving us with only the inlay. Click Export G-Code and we'll save the inlay. Now turn off the inlay and turn on the coin. But before we do the export, we have one more step. We need to add Z-Hop, or as Prusa Slicer likes to call it, Lift Z. Find it in the Filament Settings, Filament Overrides. Since the inlay is 0.6 millimeters high, set the Lift Z to 1 millimeter to make sure we clear it. Now export the G-code for the coin. That's the slicer's job done. Now it's time to print.
Now it's time to print. Naturally, we first print the inlay, and then we print the coin on top of it. The places on the coin that look like bridges actually end up fusing with the inlay. When printing a two-layer inlay, the nozzle will bump the sides just a bit as the first layer of the coin is printed, but given sufficient bed adhesion, it's not too much of a disruption. I'm using an MK8 nozzle, which has a fairly acute angle and not much thickness with 0.2 millimeters from the tip. The inlay looks pretty good. Use the side cutters and forceps to remove any little bits of string and of course peel up the skirt before printing the coin on top of it. I paused while printing the coin just so I could show you the way that the print wraps around the existing inlay on the bed. The little bit of nozzle bumping has not done any harm other than a couple of minor smudges on a part of the inlay that will be inside the print and never seen. And here's the finished print. Not perfect, but not bad. A going over with an emery board will clean up any faults. Stay tuned for a future video where I'll do a more difficult inlay and show you all of the things that go wrong when you push your luck with this technique.